You know, when I started this morning, I said we were using a lot of, most of our speakers were going to be from spring and that we were really taking advantage of the spring congregation. Well, I just realized sitting here that Jack used to be a member of the spring congregation. So not only are we using spring members as speakers, but we're using used spring <laughs> members <laughs> as, as our speakers. <laughs> so, retread. yeah, retread. Yeah, anyway. So, but now uh, we're very fortunate for Jack to be with us. We really enjoy Jack and Brenda and certainly uh, have welcomed them into our congregation. Jack used to be a member of the spring congregation where he also served as one of the elders until he uh, moved uh, to Huntsville, outside of Huntsville, and we're certainly glad that he's here. He will be speaking this hour on Paul's second prayer, and so we look forward to hearing what Jack has to say. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to get up here and speak to you. Uh, certainly uh, have our guests here with us today, uh, Raymond and Marizetti, um, which who are living proof that our borders, even up north, are porous. But... Uh, <laughs> It's uh, certainly been a pleasure to have them with us this week, and hopefully you can return back in a more permanent uh, visit next time, and certainly uh, uh, for your benefit and the benefit of uh, uh, Cherry and the mobile team back there and maybe a few others who weren't here for our lectureship in January, thought I might just take a minute to note some of the things that we mentioned about Paul's first prayer. Uh, I gave the lesson on the first prayer in chapter 1 and have been assigned a task for his second prayer in chapter 3, but there's a lot of things that we covered there just by way of remembrance that you might owe that apply here to, even to his second prayer. When we covered Paul's first prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, you know, for New Testament Christians, prayer is our only means of communing with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who is our mediator with God. We also noted then that God uh, hears the righteous, but not the sinner, 1 Peter 3.12. And sadly, we I mentioned at that time also that prayer is not practiced enough by as many as it should be. And it's a very important part of a Christian's life. We asked this question last time, why pray? The starting point of a life of prayer, of course, is to show our humility and the desire that we have to be thankful for all that God has done for us. Every genuine and sincere, reverent utterance that we as Christians make to our Heavenly Father is an expression of the realization that our strength is limited and that we need the assistance of divine prayer. Acceptable prayer takes for granted the frailty of the Christian and the unlimited strength of our Father. No matter how extensively a Christian may engage in doing good, no matter how diligently uh, he may study, we may study God's word, no matter how active and gifted we may be in the pursuit of physical necessities of life, the Christian stands continually in the need of our Father's care and his protection. In Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul tells us God promises to give us peace when we pray to him says there, And nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. As we mentioned in our last lecture, praying was important to Paul. He ministered, he worked, 
He planted churches. He preached. He trained leaders in the church. He was hardworking, though often beaten and often in prison. And yet, he's always praying. You know, sometimes we get so distracted and busy with the things in our life and of this world that we, we have trouble finding time to pray. So what could make someone as busy as Paul push all of those difficulties to the side and make time to pray? It's because praying was a priority. It was a priority for Paul just as it should be for us. So this time we're going to review Paul's second prayer to the Ephesians. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. As background, when describing himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles in verse 1 of this chapter, Paul gets a bit sidetracked. In case they were a bit troubled at whatever tribulations that he endured as a prisoner, as he mentions in verse 3, Paul stresses the fact that his apostleship to the Gentiles, even with his tribu tribulations, was a gift to him through the wonderful grace of God, verses 2 through 7. He also said that this purpose was to preach among Gentiles the uncertain riches of Christ in verses 8 through 11 and that Christ that in Christ he had boldness and access with confidence through faith in verse 12 now having the reason for his concern for the Gentiles address which he started like I say in verse 1 Paul now resumes that prayer he started in verse 1 and he picks up in verses 14 through 21, our text this evening, or afternoon, I guess. Paul continues with his prayer now for the Ephesians. And here he writes, and I want to read this, beginning in verse 14. For this cause I now I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in earth and heaven is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You know, this phrase for this cause, used in verse 14, also verse 1, indicates that Paul expresses his prayer in response to those things that were mentioned earlier in his letter, such as the wonderful salvation by grace through faith, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and the work by Christ on the cross, whereby the Gentiles can now become fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22, and also chapter 3, verse 6. It's with gratitude in his heart for God's grace toward the Gentiles that Paul now prays on their behalf, in their behalf, starting with, Respect for God, verses 14 and 15. You know, in his prayer, Paul says, I bow my knees. And, you know, here's a great man on his knees before God. You can't read these verses without sensing the deep respect and reverence that Paul has for our Creator. 
Paul is humble before God. Surely the Ephesian elders would recall those same knees bowing in prayer at Miletus in Acts chapter 20, verse 36. He kneeled down and prayed with them all. You know, kneeling is a posture in prayer commonly found throughout the scriptures. This is Luke 22, verse 41, Acts uh, 9, verses 40, uh, and also chapter 21 and verse 5. However, there does not appear to be a uh, official posture, if you will, when it comes to prayer. For example, Solomon stood when he prayed to dedicate the temple in uh, 1 Kings 8.22. David sat before the Lord when he prayed about the future of the kingdom in 1 Chronicles 17, verse 16. Jesus fell on his face when he prayed in Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 39. Personally, I pray a lot when I'm in my truck driving, especially when I'm in Houston. But uh, Jesus, you know, in his Sermon on the Mount said, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6, 6. I don't go in my closet except to get clothes. But uh, like I said, there's no official posture. The pattern example of prayer, though, in a New Testament church is to the Father. As we read in verse 14. To the Father in the name of or through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul teaches New Testament Christians of this pattern in multiple places in, the, in his epistles. He tells the Ephesians in chapter 5 verse 20 uh, to be giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the Colossians in chapter verse, uh, 3 verse 17 and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So, to the Father then, Paul addresses his prayer. His reverence for God continues in verse 15, where he acknowledges God as the Father of the whole family of heaven and earth. He recognizes God as Father for both Jew and Gentile. Paul's prayer concerns a unity that emphasizes the oneness of the kingdom, the church of our Lord, a oneness and unity in the body of Christ that he will discuss in more detail in Ephesians chapter 4. That's a teaser for the next lecture, by the way. The prayer itself is divided into three parts. And it's kind of like a, a staircase with each step leading to the next one. Um, so first we have the petition. This is in verses 16 through 19. Paul prays that the Ephesians would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Verses 16 and 17. You may recall that Paul has mentioned earlier what he's mentioned earlier about God's power toward us who believe in Ephesians 1 verse 19. Now he prays that the Ephesians might be strengthened with might according to the riches of his glory in verse 16. We see that God's strength is to be administered through his spirit in the inner man. The inner man is the real man, the real you. It's the man that God knows. For example, we see this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, where God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of his thoughts, of his heart, was only evil continually. Also in 1 Chronicles 28, uh, verse 9, where it's written, For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of thoughts. Have a scary thought there, isn't it? Several times in the New Testament, we read of Jesus knowing the thoughts of those around him, such as Luke eleven seventeen. The inward man is the man who knows 
and determines what you do and say and what is to be done. It's not the same as the outward man. You can't look on the outward man and know what a man is inside. Only you know it, but God knows it too. The real man is the inward man that Paul says is to be renewed day by day. Wherefore we faint not, but for our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. So Paul asks that they be strengthened with might by the Spirit and the inner man in verse 16. Does this mean a uh, direct operation upon the heart of man? No. If therefore, if it did, if they weren't strong enough, whose fault would it be? It would be the fault of the Holy Spirit if he didn't make them strong enough by direct operation, meaning it would be God's fault. So that can't be right. What does he mean? We only need to look further into Paul's letter to find our answer. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, Paul tells the uh, Ephesians, saying, quote, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He tells them in Ephesians 13 through 17 of the armor they're to put on, which is truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, and the sword of God, which is the word of God. You know, it's obvious that a person would be made stronger by doing what the Spirit through Paul admonishes them to do. The inner man is strengthened by the Spirit as he learns from the Spirit's teaching how to be stronger. And so in Ephesians 6, what Paul is describing is strengthening the inner man to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But the purpose, uh, the purpose of such strengthening the Spirit in Paul's prayer here is for a different purpose. A purpose that he begins to describe in verse 17. First, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. To the degree God strengthens by the Spirit the believer's inner man, so it is said that Christ himself dwells in the heart of the believer by faith. Thus the Spirit, by means of the truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, and the sword of God, which is the word of God, as mentioned in Ephesians 6, is the instrumental agent by which Christ indwells the believer. Just as Ephesians 2 verse 22 proposes, the Spirit is the instrumental agent by which God inhabits His church. Paul continued in verse 17, writing that they may be rooted and grounded in love. One work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is to instill the love of God in the heart. Paul mentions this very thing elsewhere, such as Romans chapter 5, verse 5, where he wrote, Hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Also in Galatians 5, 22, where Paul wrote, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, but it's love. When strengthened by God through the Spirit in the inner man, one becomes rooted and grounded in love. So being strengthened by God through His Spirit, by His Word, so that Christ is dwelling in our hearts, and we are well established in love, the next step is to comprehend the love of Christ, verse 18 in the first part of 19. With Christ dwelling in our hearts and being established in love, Paul continues in verse 18 by saying that we may be able. 
That's an interesting phrase. According to Thayer's Greek definitions, the word able means to be eminently able or exceedingly able to have full strength. Thus the prayer for strength in the first part of Paul's prayer, verse 16. Fully able to do what? That we may be able to comprehend, verse 18, meaning to understand, to grasp, as Paul says later in verse 19, to know. It is the love of Christ that Paul is praying that we be strong enough to understand. He wants us to know everything about this wonderful love, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. His love is not one-sided to include only the Jew and exclude the Gentiles. It was God's purpose in Christ to make the Jew and Gentile one new man in one body. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. But this love of Christ is something which passes knowledge. First part of verse 19. How is it possible to know the love of Christ if it passes knowledge? Not a contradiction, by the way. Only in the sense that no matter how much we learn about Christ's love, even with the strength that God's Spirit provides us through the Word, there's always much more to grasp, to understand, to appreciate. So there is a real knowledge of Christ's love possible to us, a knowledge that is capable of increase as we continue to be strengthened in the inner man, while complete knowledge and understanding is beyond our capacity to fully comprehend. It is only as we begin to know and understand a measure of the love of Christ that we are beginning to experience the last step for which Paul is praying, which is to be filled with all the fullness of God in verse 19, the latter half. This is the objective. This is the goal of all that's been said previously, whereby one begins to be filled filled with all the fullness of God. You know, as our inner man is strengthened by God, that is the Father, through the Spirit's teaching, meaning the Holy Spirit, of how to be stronger through the inspired Word so that Christ, the Son, can dwell in our hearts. So then you have the help of all three members of the Godhead when one is filled with the fullness of God. And more, the more they begin to comprehend the wonderful love of Christ, the more they begin to appreciate it, to understand it. As Paul wrote elsewhere, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2 verse 9. In summary, faith opens the door to the Spirit. The Spirit reveals Christ. Christ fills the heart. The heart begins to understand the love of Christ. And the love is the medium through which we become filled with God. For God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. 1 John four sixteen. And that's the petition that Paul is, makes in his second prayer on behalf of the Ephesians, that they be strengthened by the Spirit of God so that they can understand the love of Christ and thus be filled with all the fullness of God. Is God able to fulfill that petition? Now, there's no doubt in Paul's mind as we see how he closes the prayer with his praise to God. And giving glory to God for what he is able to do in verse 20. As Paul gives credit and praise to God beginning in verse 20, he does so for what he's confident God is able to do. 
Paul speaks of the greatness of God's power there in verse 20, saying, Now unto him, that's God, the Father, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Well, let's kind of break that down a bit. It comes from him that is able to do with ability that is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. You know, Paul tells the Ephesians and us today through Paul's letter that God's boundless, omnipotent power, which is able to supply more than even the thoughts or needs of men could even suggest within the scope of prayer. He is a God who knows all about us, knows our inner man, who is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is a God who is holy and just, who hates sin, Demands death as the just punishment for sins, Romans 6, 23. But he's also a loving and merciful God who through the death of his only son has provided for our salvation. Although God's power is truly unlimited, it is important that we properly understand it. God cannot be untrue to his infinite nature what do we mean by that for example god cannot do that that involves a logical contradiction such as making a round square or creating free moral beings without the possibility of sinning such things are not even possible since they're contradictions and thus are nonsense, and he cannot be less than perfect in all of his attributes. But we need to understand the distinction between what God can do and what he does do, between his ability to do and his will to do. God has the power to heal every sick person in the world. But he does not do it. He has the power to keep all of us here from dying. But he does not. These things are not part of his overall will for mankind. So the question is, what does the Bible say God does today? You know, understanding that the exercise of God's power is limited by His will, we read in verse 20 that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, but it also says, according to the power that worketh in us. What is this power? It's short. It's the gospel of God. It's gospel. It's God's word. That's the power that we have. It is the power by which we were made alive when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, verse 1. The Bible is clear that the power that saves us is the gospel, Romans 1, 16, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, and also verse 24. We were cleansed by the washing of the water with the word, Ephesians 5, 26. The power through which the Spirit strengthens the inner man mentioned in verse 16 is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The Spirit of God has always convicted, converted, taught, edified, led, and guided through the Word that He has revealed and confirmed. That Word is addressed to the intellect, to the heart of man. As men hear and believe and obey it, they are led by the Spirit of God. As Paul comes to the end of his prayer on behalf of the Ephesians, he gives glory to God in the church by Christ Jesus in verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church, the church, 
by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You know, Paul sees the church. There's only one. Ephesians 4.4. 4. As the means by which much glory can be given to God. God is to receive the glory. There is no place in the church or in the hearts of Christians for pride and vainglory. To be in the church is to be in Christ. To be in the church is to be in the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, 23 to 28. It is the church, it is in the church that God is to be glorified. It was part of the eternal plan of God that his manifold wisdom was to be made known through the church, Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11. We need to love the church as he loved the church. And it's in the church of God, it's in the church that God is to be glorified. Not some football or basketball game as we hear many athletes proclaim. As Paul says in verse 21, it is to be throughout all ages, world without end. Therefore, the glory to God through the church and Jesus Christ is now for all time, all people, all generations. The church will not be swept away by some future kingdom of God on earth. Whether in trial here on this world or in victory in the hereafter for eternity, God will be glorified by the church of Christ. Certainly, if Paul's prayer is answered, that all saints be able to comprehend the love of Christ, as mentioned in verse 18, that they may be filled with the fullness of God, verse 19, then the church has the, pinch, the potential to bring much, much glory to God. Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith within with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, such potential is to come only by Christ Jesus, as Paul mentions in verse 21. And it will be throughout all ages, world without end. So uh, what do we conclude here, this prayer? Do we desire to give God the glory through all ages, world without end? We ought to. In view of all the things that have been considered in the book of Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, which we've covered thus far in these lectures, If so, then it must be by Jesus Christ. And that can only be only uh, as we come to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge and allow ourselves to be filled with all the fullness of God. How can we be sure to be filled with all the goodness of God, the fullness of God? For one, who is already a New Testament Christian, we should follow Paul's example and start with prayer such as the one that we just read in verses 14 through 21. So as we close this lectures, these lectures today, we certainly don't want to leave here without offering an invitation to those that are here. You know, for one who is not a Christian, then you first need to become a child of God a New Testament Christian. If you know the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, won't you come? And understanding that you are lost in your sins, repent of the sin in your life. Confess His good name. Put Christ on in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. As Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, I think which Bruce quoted a little earlier, 
Uh, for as ye were all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But if you're already a New Testament Christian and your life is perhaps out of harmony with God's will, you need to look at that inner man yourself. Remember, God knows your inner man. If you're honest with yourself, you can know him too. Do you have sin in your life? You know the answer to that as well as God. If you do, won't you take care of it today? Now, we're all here. We're all assembled together. Take care of this problem. Don't get out there on that highway because you may never get another opportunity. Nobody knows you're in except for God, and you don't know it. it. might happen right out here on the street. Take care of it, for tomorrow may be too late. You need to get back on the pathway of righteousness because we have no assurance of tomorrow. We don't have assurance of the next hour. Now's the day. Now's the time. Don't delay. If we can help you with any of these spiritual matters, once you come, we stand and sing a song of invitation. Why do you wait here, Senator?